Hello folks, it's Professor Fiore, and now it's time for us to look at Class B power amp power relations. So we're going to start with a simple two transistor push-pull Class B output using a diode bias. And the first thing I want to check here is what's happening with the supplied power. One thing we noticed in Class A is that regardless of the size of the input signal, the supplied power is always the same. This is one of the negatives on a class A. So let's check what happens with a class B. We think this is going to be dynamic. In other words, as the demand for output signal grows, the supply power will grow with it. This is a more efficient process. So let's start off with just straight DC, see what we get. All right, we'll do a couple of sanity checks first. Uh, the input and output pins here should be sitting pretty much at ground, so 15 millivolts there. And over here on pin 10, we're getting negative five, so that looks great. Take a look at the uh, diode current. So this is, you got a 10K over here, 11 volt power supply. You're gonna lose seven tenths here. So we're looking maybe about a mil over here, which is what I'm seeing, a mil for that. Should be the same down in RB2, also about a mil. So right there, power dissipation, you know, you're pulling a milliamp and 11 volts on each half. So, you know, about 22, milliamp, uh, 22 milliwatts there. And then on the part of the transistors, right, for T1 and T2, the uh, quiescent currents over there, that's INPN and IPNP. Those are sitting around 90 microamps. So, okay, we've got 90 mics and, um, you know, 11 volts. So that's another milliwatt apiece. Okay, so total, total power, uh, you know, low 20, low 20 milliwatts. So far, so good. All right, so now let's do a little transient. And just to cross-check that, we're going to start off with a really small input signal. So I've only got 10 microvolts in here initially, one kilohertz. So really no AC signal to speak of. Okay, let's get our legend in here. And there's the NP, uh, current of the NPN, which we're seeing, okay, that is, you know, 90-ish like we expected. And current for the uh, PNP, same. That look, looks pretty good. You know, load current over here, excuse me, load current over here is virtually zero as expected. Okay, so nothing crazy here, right? So like I said, we're getting, you know, 20, low 20s for the, the overall supplied power. So let's crank this up, All right? Instead of 10 mics, let's put in 10 volts. So we expect this is going to be pretty much maximum signal. Right, I've got 11 volt plus and minus power supplies, which I've really, I just added a volt over 10 volts to compensate for the turn on and um, base emitters for the two transistors. So this should give us a pretty clean 10 volt peak signal. In any case, we'll come up here and do a transient analysis. Boom, all right, so we can see, got a nice big signal over here. So that blue, now highlighted in red, is V-load. That looks good. That's right before clipping. You can see we're going on each one of these things just a smidge below the input signal. So that looks good. Um, these currents down here are too small to see. So I am going to change scale over here. Turn this into plus and minus 10 milli for my scale move this over all right so you know the blue coming out here is that signal that's uh you know the the load voltage and we just have these other ones for the various currents so first i'm just going to click on this so there's a nice sine wave that's the load current right that's peaking out at 10 mils which would make sense our uh, load resistance is 1k over here all right now if you're wondering hey isn't that kind of high an 04 and 06 small signal transistors. Yeah, 
I use these values not to do a realistic, you know, power amplifier that's going to drive a loudspeaker, but this is something you can actually check in lab. You can build this thing right in lab and verify all these things with your scope. All right, that's the reason why I use these values. In any case, you know, that this makes sense. We've got uh, a 10 milliamp through a 1K, so that's going to give us 10 volt swing. That looks great. All right, then we're going to switch over to here. All right, so this is highlighted right there. That is the NPN current. So this is the push part, All right? So this is currents coming down like so, right? We're pushing current into the load. And again, that part looks good. We have the uh, positive half wave of the output. Then transistor turns off during the negative half wave. Now that power, okay, that's, um, if you think about that for a second, you've, you've got this 10 milliamps, all right, um, how does that average out? Well, that's going to average out, this is a half wave, so this is basically the peak value divided by pi, or multiplied by 0 0.318, all right, so you're looking at a little over 3 milliamps of, of current here. Well, hmm, multiply that out by your source voltage for both halves, of course, and you're going to wind up with more power than we had before. In other words, when we had a zero input. So just to continue here, here is the PNP's current, again, off during the positive and pulsing just like the NPN did on the uh, other half. All right, so those two things come together and we get the full load current swing. All right, so it's apparent just from this that it must be the case that the power has gone up, right? We're, we're pulling just on the load alone this 10 milliamp peak current. So we still have the 22 volt total power supply. We're clearly pulling um, a greater power than before. All right, so that's sort of item number one, right? That's, that's key element number one. Power clearly is dependent on the size of the input signal. That's a dynamic situation. That's good. It's adaptive. Now, the second half of this is what about the transistor power dissipation? So I've modified the circuit here a little bit to include a voltage, right, a voltage meter across the power transistor. And we're going to start with a, a relatively small input signal. So here's a um, 10 millivolt input kind of small, and we'll see what we get out of here. All right, so we'll do a transient analysis first. And as you can expect, there's not a whole lot to see here because it's so tiny. All right, now I've got my uh, tiny little signal down here, right? There's my V load. You can't even hardly see a, any kind of variation in this thing. Yeah, it just nothing to speak of. Okay, there's your VCE just sitting there, you know, pretty much at 11 volts. Now what I want to do to find the power is we're going to go to the post processor. I open this up like usual. And that is going to equal, right, the power in the transistor is the voltage across the times the current through it. So I'm just going to grab I of NPN, copy that down in here, grab my multiply symbol, and then we're going to multiply that by VCE from our meter. All right, so that is going to be the power in the NPN. Now, I happen to know that the power in the NPN, when you think about these numbers for a sec, a few milliamps of current, um, this is going to be really small scale. So what I am going to do is I'm going to multiply this and this is just a little shortcut, so I'm not constantly rescaling the vertical axis here. I'm just going to multiply this by a thousand, right? So I'm going to call this P of NPN um, 1K, meaning times a thousand. Also, just make it easier, easier for us. All right. So get rid of our old one, put in a new one, bonk, and that's this. All right, so you can see that's really tiny, really tiny. 
So uh, now think of this in terms of milliwatts because we've multiplied it by a thousand. So that's sitting around a milliwatt, a tiny little power. So let's crank it up. So we'll go over here and um, we'll increase it a little bit. Let's put in three volts. And repeat the process. Okay. So there's our VCE. There's our load voltage as expected. And then right here is the power. So we can see we're getting this half sign, which again would make sense, right? Because it's only on for the positive half wave. And this is peaking up here at, well, there's 20. So this is 25, less than 25 uh, milliwatt peak, right? Probably somewhere around 23 or 24 without getting out the cursor. Um, but that's what we have, all right? All right, so that's increased. Power dissipation is going up. Remember in the class A, it was, it was backwards. We had the greatest power dissipation in the power transistor when there was no signal. And then as we turned up the signal, the power was shifted to the load and the transistor was actually running cooler. So this thing is a little bit more intuitive in that you know, we turn up the juice, so to speak. We turn up the signal and we're getting uh, greater power dissipation in the transistor. All right, so let's crank this up to its max. So that's a 10 volt swing and we'll see what we get. All righty, that's a pretty funky looking waveform. All right, so we get this interesting kind of double hump thing here. Um, so here's our, uh, this is the VCE, right? Which is our nice big signal, nearly 20 volts, roughly 20 volts peak to peak. And here's what we're getting for the power. So, you know, we get this dip in here because, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a, uh, a product of voltage and current. So although we get a, a maximum in terms of uh, a voltage, right, there could be a minimum in current or vice versa. I could have a maximum in current and a, and a minimum in voltage, which is exactly what's happening here. When we get the big pulse of current, all right, that's when we start seeing uh, the minimum voltage drop over here because the voltage is dropping across the load. So KVL tells you that's got to drop down. And consequently, we see this power curve that kind of has this weird dip in it, all right? Well, the average power dissipation is basically the area under the curve. So the preceding one we had just sort of peaked up around here. And the question becomes, where is the maximum? Where is it the highest area under the curve? So, in the textbook, we go through a proof of this with an ideal transistor. And it turns out that it's around 64% of the load line. So for us, we're going to come in here and we are going to change this to 6.5 volts. And then we're going to rerun this. And look at that shape. So it's still topping out at about the same value, right? There's our 30, same scale, but now it's filled in. So there is, in fact, a greater area under this curve than there is here. All right, yes, it's a little bit steeper on the edges for this one, but you have this huge trough in the center. And they're peaking at basically the same value. So, yeah, this definitely has greater area. So it turns out that the maximum heating for the transistor does not occur at full signal strength. It actually occurs at uh, somewhere around two-thirds of the load line, a little less than two-thirds of the load line, which, um, in fact, turns out to be somewhere, you know, in the 40-ish percent, a little less than 40 percent, of the maximum output power. So although it's true that as you turn it up, things get hotter, the hottest part for the transistor is not at full maximum signal swing. It's a bit less than that, right? Maybe that's an unexpected outcome, but you know, 
there it is that's how we figure it out all right and just a little side note uh, this actually tells you why you know back in the 1970s the FTC came up with uh, in the US that's the Federal Trade Commission came up with certain requirements for home amplifiers power amplifiers and receivers there was an issue with companies going through what I would call sort of a power ratings war people understood that more power to loudspeaker was you know maybe a better measure right more power was better um, so companies started come on, coming up with very imaginative sorts of ways of, of indicating what their power was and you would see things like uh, peak impulse music power and you know weird things like this and for the life of me you know who knows how they actually calculated these things but um, you could actually find amplifiers that had power ratings to their loudspeakers that were higher than the power that they were rated to come off the wall well you tell me how that's possible but in any case the FTC came in and said okay you know we're, we're going to go through a very rigid thing here so although it might not be perfect everybody's going to be on an even keel everybody can uh, use the same methodology and it'll be a fair comparison for the consumer so the consumer isn't just sort of you know left wandering around in a daze here trying to figure out what the heck is going on um, so they stipulated a rating that had to be said something like this um, if you had a stereo amplifier they would say okay the output is 100 watts rms meaning a sine wave rms calculated power so 100 watts uh, rms both channels driven simultaneously with no more than a certain amount of this of, of distortion so maybe you know 0.01 percent thd or whatever it was and then a frequency range from 20 to 20 kilohertz and that was the spec okay in order to do that test the amplifier had to be as they say preconditioned you actually had to run the thing at one third of its maximum rated power so if the amplifier was rated for 100 watts you'd actually have to run this thing at one third of that at 33 watts for I believe it was half an hour so they wanted to make sure that everything came up to temperature essentially so it was a pretty rigorous test why did they choose one third power well this is the reason right here because one third power is going to be pretty darn close to maximum heating on those power transistors they wanted to make sure that things were thermally stressed interestingly enough that uh, rating was never applied to automotive audio it was only for home audio so you know smart people understood you could not compare an amplifier that was specced for the home versus one that was specced for a car they were not on an even keel in any case so we find out that the class b is more efficient than the class a in a number of different respects right the the uh, power is dynamic the power draw from the wall so to speak is dynamic it goes up as the input signal demand goes up and the power dissipation on the transistor goes up but only to a certain point when you get up to um you know like I said somewhere in the 65 ish percent of load line so again 40 ish percent of power um, that's where the actual maximum heating of the power transistor occurs okay beautiful questions put them down in the comments and until next time have a good one